Um, what we do when we um, act, don't actually have a probability distribution for um, the parent population, but we want to estimate um, some information um, about a derived distribution, like for example, the mean invariance. And so uh, we're going to kind of develop the tools that we need to do that. Um, today I have uh, joining me uh, some folks from the lab. Uh, so um, I've got uh, Meg and Irene and Asal and Morverid here uh, listening in on the lecture. Um, and the reason I have sunglasses is because I, I forgot my regular glasses. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to let you know in case they raise wild objections during the video. <laughs> you know what's going on. Okay. And so uh, with that, let me go ahead and get the... Um, Screen share started. And get the pointer. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so um, basically, uh, what we're going to be focusing on today uh, is this idea of taking moments of functions of random variables. Um, and, and the setup is this. Uh, sometimes uh, we cannot derive the probability distribution um, analytically for a problem of interest. But we would still like to estimate, say, the mean and or variance of uh, some dependent random variable, given, um, say, a formula, G, which describes the dependent random variable and um, one or more independent random variables. And so uh, here's kind of the math of it. Uh, say we have a dependent random variable, uh, Z, uh, that depends on a set of independent random variables, X1 through Xn as follows. So we've got that G function, which uh, was kind of undetermined at this point. Um, and in principle, what we want to do is um, determine the um, various moments of that dependent random variable Z, such as um, the, uh, the first moment, which is going to be the mean or expected value of the random variable Z. And so um, if we wanted to do that, of course, we could simply use the, um, the mathematical definition of an expectation. Um, and in the case where the dependent variable depends on multiple random variables, it's kind of a nasty looking uh, equation. So um, our mean or expected value for that random variable C would be the integral uh, over the entire domain of all of the, uh, the Xi's, X1 through Xn, um, of that uh, function which relates Z to each of the X1 through Xn's, um, weighted by the joint probability distribution for x1 through xn. Okay, so that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, but, but the issue we're going to deal with um, in a few minutes is the fact that in general we don't, we don't actually know what that um, parent probability or joint probability distribution is. So we're going to have to make some approximations. And uh, if math could, um, you know, could uh, uh, draw, <laughs> this integral might, might uh, end up looking a little bit like this guy or girl, I'm not sure. Okay, so um, let's look at sp some specific examples of the uh, function G, okay? And we're going to start simple. So let's say that the um, function G is just a linear uh, function like this. So we have, instead of Z, our random dependent random variable here is Y. And um, our independent random variable is X. So we have only one random variable, independent random variable, and the relationship between the dependent and the independent random variable is linear. So about as simple as we can get with the idea that the, uh, the variables A and B are just constants. Okay, so um, we can um, estimate then the mean for Y is the expected value of Y, and of course Y is just equal to AX plus B, so we can substitute that in um, for um, Y here. Now we know that the um, expected value, and we're going to show that in a second mathematically, but it's a linear operator, so it's going to move through um, this, uh, you know, this term here. So we end up with uh, a pulling out the expectation of, of x plus b times the expectation of one, um, and the expectation of one. Yeah, let me see. I guess I don't have a that um, right now. But anyway, the expectation of one is just the um, integral from minus infinity to infinity of the PDF, which of course is just one. So we end up with uh, that term being just b. And the expect expectation of x is just the, um, the mean of x. So, um, so basically what we find is that the, the mean of y here if the relationship between y and x is given by this formula, is just going to be a times the mean of x plus b. And we can um, 
sort of uh, uh, unpack this um, this particular uh, expression a little bit. So the expected value of ax plus b is just written as again the integral over the domain of x of ax plus b times the PDF of x, and then you can see uh, just very simply um, kind of cleaning this up. We end up with uh, the first moment of the PDF with respect to x, and that, of course, is just the expected value of x. And so basically, I'm just writing out um, in mathematical terms what, what um, is already sort of given here. And then you can see this clearly goes to 1, just by definition of the probability density function. If you integrate it over the domain, you get 1, and this is the mean uh, by definition of the uh, PDF for x. And so that's our final result. And so when we have this linear relationship between a uh, dependent random variable and a single independent random variable, the mean for y is just equal to a times the mean for x plus b. OK, so let's um, get a little bit more wild here. So imagine that now we have a situation where the random variable, the dependent random variable, depends on two independent random variables, uh, x1 and x2. Uh, and these are not necessarily statistically independent. Uh, and they're weighted by A1 and A2 here. So uh, how does that go? Um, so again, the mean of Y is going to be the expectation of Y. And now it gets a little bit tricky. So we have to do a double integral because we've got these two independent random variables, X1 and X2, um, of the, um, the uh, the y, which in this case is just uh, a1 times x1 plus a2 times x2, and then weighted by the joint probability distribution for x1 and x2. So this would only be uh, the probability distribution of x1 times the probability of x <laughs> probability density function of x2 if x1 and x2 were statistically independent. So we don't know that, and so we're going to keep that as a, as a joint probability distribution function again, integrated over the entire domain of x1 and x2. Um, so this is kind of fun. Obviously, we can pass the, um, the PDF here, the joint PDF, in through this um, uh, bracket. And so we end up with two integrals, one for uh, you know, this first term and the second one for the second term. Obviously, the a1 and the a2 can pull out, which I've done here. Um, and now this is a really neat result. So we've got a double integral of a joint PDF, but it's weighted by only one of the variables. And so this really is the, um, it is the expectation of the marginal distribution for x1. <laughs> it's marginal because we're summing up over all of x2, and then we're weighting um, the, what's left, the PDF, for x1. So in other words, in this case, we can really rewrite this double integral as a single integral because we've um, essentially integrated away x2 of the first moment of the PDF for x1, which uh, by definition is just a1 times the mean of x1. And likewise here, we're integrating, um, essentially remember we've got x2 is awaiting, so we integrate away the variable x1, and so we're really looking at the um, first moment or expected value of the marginal distribution for x2, which is just going to be a2 times the mean of x2. And so the net result is that if you have this a relationship between the dependent variable, random variable and then two independent random variables, just a linear relationship, the mean of y is just going to be uh, a1 times the mean of x1 plus a2 times the mean of x2 a very cool result that also takes into account the sort of marginal distribution um, theory that we learned earlier. Um, well, we can generalize that uh, set of results. So if we have a random variable y, which is a, um, a weighted sum of n independent random variables xi, um, the, um, <laughs> you basically go through the same exact process. So the mean or the expected value of y is going to be the uh, all the integrals over the various xi's. Um, and then just like as before, when we take in the, when we distribute the PDF through all of these terms, uh, essentially we're going to get the marginal distribution, and we're going to get the, um, the expectation of the marginal distribution with respect to x1 plus the uh, marginal distribution uh, uh, 
uh, the expected value of the marginal distribution with respect to x2 and so forth and so on. And that's what I'm showing here. And so because each of these are just the mean of x1, x2, and so forth and so on, we end up finally with this result, whereas if we have this relationship between the dependent random variable and all the independent random variables xi, the mean is just gonna be the sum over all of those um, various i values of ai times the mean uh, of xi. Okay, so we, we figured out um, quite a lot for at least linear uh, combinations of random variables, uh, how to calculate the means. What about the variance? So we want some measure of spread as well, right? So we go back to our first example of the simplest case where we have the uh, dependent random variable is a linear function of a single independent random variable x here. And uh, in that case, the variance <clears throat> um, of y is just going to be the expected value of the difference between y and the mean of y squared. Um, and then one can go ahead and um, uh, sort of uh, expand that um, quadratic term. And so you're going to get, and then also substitute for y the ax plus b. So you get ax plus b minus, um, and then we have from mu y, the result was that mu y is equal to a mu x plus b, right? And so uh, we actually haven't expanded the, the uh, quadratic term yet. We just substituted our results for what's known for y and what we found for mu y from the last um, couple slides. And so we end up with this result, and of course, clearly the b's cancel. And so, and then we're left with ax minus a mu x, the a's pull out, um, but we've got the square term here. So basically what it, we end up with is a squared times the expected value of x minus mu x, and you should all recognize this beautiful thing here, that, my friends, is just the variance of x, or sigma x squared. So in this case, when we have this linear relationship between the dependent random variable and a single uh, independent random variable, the variance of y is just equal to a squared times the uh, variance of x. And what's really interesting here is the b nowhere We've lost b. <laughs> so, um, so with respect to the variance, the variance is not affected by that constant term there, even though it is affected by, it does affect the mean. All right, so let's look at the variance of the case where we have two independent random variables, x1 and x2, again, weighted by a1 and a2. Um, we basically play the same game. So uh, remember the variance of y is just the expected value of y minus mu y. Um, and y in this case is a1x1 plus a2x2. That's what I've substituted here. And then uh, mu y from the last slide is a1 mu x1 plus a2 mu x2. So I substitute that in as well. Now I can rearrange these so that basically consolidating everything involving x1 and everything involving x2. And then I can um, expand the quadratic this time, right? So I end up with this term squared times the cross product term. Um, sorry, let me start over again. So this term squared plus the cross product term between these two plus this last term squared. And that's what I've got here. And of course, this expected um, expectation can distribute because it's a linear operator. And I can also pull out all the constants. And so um, now we've got something really interesting. So this is a1 squared times the, times the expectation of x1 minus mu x1 squared. And everybody should recognize that as the variance of x1. And then this term here is going to be a2 squared times the variance of x2. And this term <laughs> is a1 times a2 times the covariance between x1 and x2. So, um, so that's what these terms represent uh, physically. And so in the end, when we have this relationship between a dependent variable and two random variables, uh, x1 and x2, um, the variance is going to be equal to a1 squared times the variance of x1 plus a2 squared times the variance of x2 plus the covariance a1 times a2 times the covariance between x1 and x2, 
where covariance is defined as the expectation of the product of x1 minus mu x1 times x2 minus mu x2. And then if we generalize this um, into a sort of a sum of n uh, random variables xi all weighted by separate ai values, um, basically we can go through the same game. Um, <clears throat> this is just a little bit of math, but it basically works out the same. So we start out with the variance of y as being the expectation of y minus the mean of y squared. We substitute in um, our expression for y here. And then we also had a result for the mean of y, which was just the sum over um, all i of a i times mu i. So we have that result. Um, these can be consolidated. Um, we have the index going from i equal to 1 to n in both sums. So we can basically consolidate these uh, two terms together into one sum. Um, and the next thing that we can do is, uh, let me see, what did I do here? I can pull out an a i from both terms, no, no problem there, simple math. <clears throat> and the next thing I can do um, is, what am I doing here? Oh, yes, okay, so basically I have this term squared, right? So I can express it as a product of two terms, and you know, it doesn't matter, I can change my index here, because it's gonna be running independently anyway. So I'm gonna um, let this index be i equal to one to n, and then this index be j equal to one to n. Right. And furthermore, because these two indices are, <laughs> are different, I can combine the two sums together and express that, uh, that product of sums as the uh, sums of products. So I end up with this relationship here. And the next thing I notice is that this is a linear operator involving a bunch of sum terms. So I can bring the linear operator inside the sum and the constants come out. And so I end up with this. And now you can see that whenever the index i and j are equal, the expectation of this product here is just the uh, variance for that, uh, that particular index. And whenever i and j are different, it's gonna be the covariance. And so basically what I can do then is write this um, variance of y as being the, uh, the sum over all of the variances of xi's weighted by their corresponding ai squared, plus then all the cross product terms, so j is not equal to i, of all the covariances between the various um, uh, xi and I, xj's. So um, just to summarize then, um, if we have this sort of general relationship between a dependent random variable and a whole series of independent random variables, this is the, um, the sort of complete expression for the variance of y in terms of the variances in x and the covariances in between the various uh, random variables xi and xj. <clears throat> if these are statistically independent, then of course the covariance is zero by definition, and so that simplifies just to this first term here. And so in that case, the variance of y is just equal to the sum over all the variances of xi is weighted by their corresponding ai squared. Okay, so um, in the last set of examples, we've focused on situations where we had an explicit linear relationship between the dependent variable and the random variable, but what happens when we don't have, um, say, a linear relationship, but it's more generic, it's some function of g. And we're gonna start with a case where we just have a general function of a single random variable. And we're going to apply what's called a first order approximation for calculating the mean of that uh, general function. So let me get explicit about it. So basically we have a dependent random variable, which is some function g of an independent random variable x. And what we'd like to know ultimately is we'd like to be able to calculate the mean of y um, and also the variance of y from the, um, the function itself and then, um, you know, uh, ideally, we would know something about the probability density function for x. And in fact, I mean, I think I even say this here in a lot of words, um, if we knew the probability density function for x, and of course we would know g, we could just evaluate this integral numerically, right? So we could then estimate the corresponding uh, mean for y just numerically. 
or we might even get lucky and, and this integral would resolve analytically. Either way, if we know the probability distribution for x, we're good as gold. Um, likewise for the variance, if we knew the um, probability density function for x, uh, we would know mu y because we would have calculated it from this expression here. And of course we would know gx because that's given. And so we could then numerically or analytically evaluate this integral here. But the reality is that we often don't know um, the, uh, the probability density function for x. Um, maybe all we're given is the mean and the, the variance of x. So is there a way of estimating the mean and variance of y given only the mean and variance of x? So we only have partial information about that probability density function, only its central tendency and, and dispersion. And so that's really what we want to look at next, develop essentially um, a theory for estimating the mean and variance of y from the mean and variance of x without further information about the PDF for x. How we do that is we basically um, perform a Taylor series expansion on the function g of x centered on the mean for the random variable x. So what does that look like? So we just express g of x as uh, you know, g evaluated at the mean of x plus, and then we're just basically doing a Taylor series expansion about the mean. So we have a linear term. Um, so that's just the slope of g with respect to x times the distance that we're going away from the mean. And then this would be the second order term here. And then of course you have infinite number of terms in principle. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a first order approximation. So basically what that means is we're gonna truncate all of the second and higher order terms. So they're gone. And so we're gonna approximate g of x as just g evaluated at the mean plus that first order term, essentially the slope of g with respect to x times the distance that you go away from the mean. And here's the really cool bit. If you then take the definition from uy, which is the expectation of y, um, and of course that's going to be equal to the integral over the domain of g of x times the PDF dx, now, if we substitute for g of x our first order Taylor series expansion here, uh, we end up with this expression be sort of an approximation of that mean for y. This is really a sweet result because basically now we can distribute the integral across these two terms. Um, notice that g evaluated in ux is just a constant, and so it's going to pull out of the, the first integral. And then you're left with the integral of the PDF from minus infinity to infinity, which of course is one. And then likewise in this term, um, this thing here, it's the slope of G with respect to X, but evaluated at the mean. And so it is actually a constant as well. It's just a number. And so it pulls out of the integral as well. And so then what you're left with here is you're gonna be left with X times the PDF integrated from minus infinity to infinity. And of course, we recognize this term as being the mean of x. And then what we have left is minus the mean of x times that constant slope again, times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the PDF, which is just one by definition of the, um, of the probability density function. And so what we're left with then is g evaluated at mu x times one, or just g at mu x, plus, and then we have the slope of g evaluated at mu x times mu x, and then we also have a minus the same thing. So these two terms basically cancel. So uh, the really cool result is that for a completely generic function without knowing anything about the prob underlying probability density function for x, we can estimate the mean for y uh, as the, um, the function g evaluated at um, the mean for x. So that would be the first order approximation for the, uh, the mean of y given the mean of x. We can also do a second order approximation. So instead of truncating the Taylor series expansion at the first order term, instead of cutting it off here, we could um, include the second order term as sort of the acceleration of that curve, um, which is represented here by the uh, second derivative of g with respect to x squared. 
Um, and so when we do that, basically when we plug and chug um, back into our um, mathematical definition for the expected value of y, what we're left with is essentially that the, um, the mean for y is going to be first off g evaluated in ux, so that's our first order uh, approximation, plus then a term, uh, second order term here involving the, uh, the variance of x. Uh, and then also the derivative of the function g with respect to x twice, um, second derivative, again evaluated at x equal mu x. So, um, so that's kind of nice. Um, now that we've got some or first and a second order approximation for the means, we can um, tackle the uh, variance. And um, so again, we're looking at the variance of a general function of a single random uh, variable, and we're looking only at the first order approximation at this point. So first order approximation means that we're approximating g by Taylor series expansion, but we're cutting off all the second order and higher terms. And then we basically um, plug this, uh, this approximation into our definition for the variance, which is going to be the expected value of y minus the mean for y squared. So y is going to be, um, uh, <laughs> y is by definition g of x, right? So y is equal to g of x in this case. And g of x is being approximated by our Taylor series expansion. So this thing is y. And then um, we know from the previous result that the mean for y can be approximated as uh, g evaluated in mu x. Now, notice that this g evaluated at mu x cancels with this g evaluated at mu x, and so you're left with this term weighted by the probability density function and integrated over the domain. <clears throat> and basically, then one can um, sort of uh, clean this up a little bit. Um, the main thing to notice is that the, this term here is just a constant, it's just a number. So it's the slope of g evaluated at x equal to the mean squared. And so it can be pulled out of the integral. And then what you're left with is this little sweet thing here, which of course you'll recognize as the expected value of x minus mu x, which of course is the variance of x. So that's going to be sigma x squared. So in the final analysis then, if you have this generic relationship, so the random variable y is a uh, generic function of some random variable x, the corresponding variance for y is going to be approximated but to first order by the uh, slope of g with respect to x, so the dif differentiation of g with respect to x evaluated at mu x squared times the variance of x. Um, okay, one can play this game with the, uh, you know, taking it out to the second order. So if we included the second order term, I'm not going to go through the details of the math because it's uh, kind of uh, hairy. Um, but the bottom line <laughs> is that um, in that event, the variance can be expressed in terms of uh, uh, actually four terms, one, two, three, four terms altogether. Um, the main thing that to recognize is that now you've got the expectation of the third central moment and also the fourth central moment of the PDF for X. And generally speaking, we don't have that, that information. So it's very rare that we would use the uh, second order approximation um, for the variance. Although we could absolutely use the second order approximation for the mean, which in general is more important anyway. I mean, we want some measure of the variance, but maybe we don't need that variance to be as accurate as we need the mean to be. And let's go through a quick example. So this is example 4.25. Um, so in this case, we've got the maximum impact pressure in pounds per square foot of ocean waves on coastal structures may be estimated by the following formula. So basically, we have the pressure that uh, the structure is experiencing is equal to 2.7 times the density of the water um, times the uh, the uh, wave propagation velocity squared. And that's going to be a random variable. Um, and then k over d, it basically, the, this is a model, so k is the length of a hypothetical piston, I guess, associated with the wave motion 
Um, and D is uh, the thickness of an air cushion. I have really no idea what this is. I guess when the wave hits an object, uh, there's some air that's being compressed and so it cushions the impact. So uh, basically they tell us that we can assume that K over D is about 35. Um, we are further told, so we don't have a PDF for you, so we can't use our fancy uh, theory to derive a PDF for um, the pressure. All we're told is that we have um, that advancing wave velocity has a mean of 4.5 feet per second and a covariance of 20%. So this is a case where we're going to use an estimate of the, the mean and the standard deviation or variance for you to estimate um, a mean and standard deviation or variance for the uh, pressure experienced by the coastal structure. So in fact, we're asked, compute the first order mean and variance of the maximum impact pressure and then we're also asked, how much does the mean change if the second order approximation is used instead of the first order approximation? Okay, so um, let's recall that when we have this kind of generic uh, relationship between y and a single random variable x, which in this case, I guess that's the other thing I wanna point out, um, they set up the problem so uh, the water, seawater density and this k over d are assumed to be constant. So we only have a single random variable, which is u. So in this case, we can treat it as a uh, dependent random variable, that's our uh, pressure uh, impact um, of the waves on the structure, is a single function of the random variable x, which in this case is the propagation velocity of the, the waves. <clears throat> and we know that that can be approximated to first order by just simply that function evaluated at the mean for x. So that would be the mean for the wave propagation. And so in that case, the function evaluated at the mean for the wave propagation is 2.7 rho k over d times the, uh, the mean of that wave propagation squared. And so when we work that out, it's 3,750 pounds per square foot. Um, now we were also asked to see how that approximation changes if we use the second order approximation for the mean. And so in that case, basically we have both the um, function g evaluated at the mean, plus then we have this extra term where we have to take the second derivative of g with respect to x squared, evaluate it at the mean, and then multiply it by the variance of uh, x over two. So uh, what does that look like? Well, we can, we've already computed this first term, um, the uh, function g evaluated at the mean, that's 3750 pounds per square foot. So we can just, oops, that should be, F not I, <laughs> so 3750 pounds per square foot, plus then one half or 0.5 times uh, sigma x squared, that's gonna be uh, the covariance times the mean. So we were told the covariance was 0.2, I mean, sorry, the coefficient of variation was 0.2, the mean's 0.45 or 4.5. So we take that, that gives us the standard deviation, and then we square it. So that takes care of this term here. Um, if you take this, uh, let me go back to the uh, formula here. If you take the derivative of this pressure with respect to u twice, well, if you think about it, if we take the first derivative of p with respect to u, we're gonna pull a two down. So we're gonna have two times 2.7. Uh, and then of course, u will be to the one power. And then we take a second derivative what happens is everything remains the same except for u disappears. So, um, so that's what we have here. This second derivative of pm with respect to u squared evaluated at the mean is just going to be 2. That's coming from the first derivative times 2.7 rho k over d. u has disappeared because of the second derivative. k over d is 35. The density of seawater is 1.96. And so that works out to 370 for this term here. So we plug and chug, and it works out to 3,900 pounds per square foot. So basically what we find is that the second order prediction is 3,900 minus 3,750 over 3,750, or about 4% larger than the first order prediction, but pretty close. And you, know, you might pause to just contemplate the magic here. Um, we've derived, without having any knowledge of the PDF, it could be a really weird PDF, right? We, it could be normal or log normal or beta or you know who knows what. Um, without having any knowledge of the PDF, we're able to estimate the means of the derived distribution um, from this uh, theory.
Okay. Um, we're also asked to determine the variance, and in this case, we're just going to use our approximation uh, for the first order uh, variance. And so that was basically that we take that second derivative of g with respect to x evaluated at the mean, oh, sorry, the first derivative, and we square it. Um, and then we multiply by the variance of x. <clears throat> so in that case, we've got essentially the first derivative, uh, we still have a u, uh, because we, in the case where we took the second derivative, we lost the u, but in the first derivative, we still have a u here, which we're going to replace with the mean, because it's evaluated at the mean. And then we also have this two from that first derivative. So, um, so everything, this basically equals that uh, first derivative evaluated x squared. And then times the variance, well, that's going to be just the um, coefficient of variation times the mean squared. And if we were interested in the um, standard deviation instead of the variance, we would just take the square root, which gets rid of these squares here. And so we basically just have a whole series of numbers. We multiply them together, and we get 1,500 PSO. So basically, the, um, the mean is around 3,900 PSF. The standard deviation, in this case, is about 1,500 PSF. All right, so um, the last bit of um, kind of uh, uh, shenanigan is really to, um, to look at the theory for the case where uh, we don't just have one random variable uh, you know, on the right-hand side, but now we have n random variables. So we have an arbitrary function of n random variables. Um, and so let's look at the uh, first order approximation for uh, the mean. Let's start with that, for the mean. So in this case, we're looking for the mean of y, which is the expect expectation of y, which is going to be the integral uh, over all of these different, um, you know, independent variables, x1 through xn, um, of the function itself evaluated at all of those different variable or values of x1 through xn, weighted by the joint probability distribution, uh, where it's a joint between all the various um, uh, xn, x1, x2, x and xn um, random, independent random variables. So we begin, uh, as usual, by approximating g uh, with a Taylor series expansion. This is going to be a first order approximation. And it's going to be um, Taylor series about the mean for each of the xi's. And so in that case, we have basically um, the function itself. So this is the function we're approximating. It's going to be the function itself evaluated at each of the means for all of these um, independent random variables, x1 through xn, plus then the slopes. And it's going to be basically the partial, in this case, of g with respect to each of the um, random variables xi evaluated at their corresponding means times the distance you go away from the mean summed over all of the various um, independent random variables x1 through uh, xn. And of course, you have these higher um, order terms, which we're uh, dropping. And when you substitute in, uh, when you substitute this back into the definition. Basically, you're going to get the same um, beautiful result that we had before. <laughs> it's exactly the same kind of um, theoretical approach. But basically, the net result is that the mean for y is just approximated as the function g evaluated at the means for all the various x, um, x1, x2 through xn values. So that's kind of cool. Um, for the variance, uh, basically, we follow a very uh, sort of similar procedure. This is the, um, the definition of the variance, the ex expectation of y minus mu y squared, which is just going to be the integral over all those various independent random variables um, of that difference between g and mu y squared, weighted by the joint probability distribution of all the random variables, independent random variables. And I'm going to spare you the details, but uh, when you substitute in uh, that first order Taylor series expansion into this integral, uh, you can solve it to get the following result. So that basically um, the variance of y is approximately equal to the sum all over all the variances of x weighted by the derivative of g with respect to each of those independent variables evaluated the mean squared. So uh, that would be fairly straightforward to, um, to approximate. And in fact, this term here has a very specific definition. It's called sensitivity. It's how sensitive the function g is with respect to a particular um, variable. 
And then you have um, the second term is basically the sum over all the various covariances. So uh, this is the, um, the correlation coefficient between random variable i and j, the corresponding um, uh, standard deviations for xi and xj. You can actually recognize this combination of terms as the definition of the covariance of ij weighted by the partial of g with respect to xi and the partial of g with respect to xj. And just summing over all uh, values of i from 1 to n and all values of j, so long as j is not equal to i. So um, you could actually write this as a single double sum um, where this would be just all of the uh, cases where i was equal to j. So we're just separating them out. The reason we're separating them out is because in the event that all the xi are statistically independent, these row ij's are zero. And so you get, end up with this result here, where, um, again, you're approximating the variance of y from the sum of the variances of xi's weighted by the, uh, the derivative, the sensitivity. And this, these two equations actually go by um, a term called propagation of uncertainty. So say you had some function, g, that was relating some set of random variables to a uh, you know, dependent random variable you cared about, and you wanted to know how the variance of y was responding to uncertainty in all of these random variables x1 through xn. This would allow you to do that or assess that. In the event that all the xi are statistically independent, what it's saying is that the variance in y is equal to the sum of the variances in xi weighted by the sensitivity of that g function to each xi squared. And then if you have, uh, if the xi's are not statistically independent, you also have to account for the correlation between all of the various xi's to evaluate the, or approximate that variance for y. And so with that, um, I wanted to end and just ask the folks sitting in the, um, the office here if there are any questions. No, everybody's like, just get me out of here, just like you guys. <laughs> All right, so let me uh, shut down here. Um, so I will figure out eventually what, what I want to do. Ah, oh, yes, stop screen sharing. And there we go. And you can say hi to everybody here. So there's us all, Maury, Meg, <laughs> and Irene. <laughs> All right, see you later.